Arab Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And friends, tonight's message is going to be a message I know will bless literally millions of people. And I'm counting on you to try to get this message out. It is a message that not only blesses my Gentile uh, friends, the house of Israel that is already believing Yeshua as the Mashiach, uh, but as well as the Jewish community. And I can't begin to encourage you enough. You need to share this with every Jewish friend you have. And my Jewish brothers and sisters that are listening tonight, understand, I come from your background as well. Both my parents, mother and father, were Jews. They were non-practicing Jews. But they were Jews just the same. And as a result, my family never went to Christianity. I was the first one in my family that was a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah at the age of eight years old. London, uh, excuse me, London Baptist Church in Castleberry, Alabama. My mother visited there with a friend and something struck my heart. And I believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. Since then, though, as the years have gone on, he has dealt with me in a miraculous way to uncover hidden insights inside the Tanakh that clearly identify who the Mashiach is. The story of Joseph is one that I know many of my Jewish friends have heard before. You've heard the similitudes of that of uh, Yeshua or Jesus as it is said in the Greek language of his name there. And you may already have a fixed opinion about that. But tonight I'm going to share some things with you that you've not considered before. And I think you need to take the time to listen. At times I get a little bit loud. And I do apologize for those of you that uh, it's like, Steve, can you not yell so loud? I'm partially deaf in one ear and don't hear hardly at all. So, uh, so for me, when I talk loud, to me it's not loud. It may be really loud for you guys, so I do apologize for that. But it's also, I get excited under that inspiration as the Holy Spirit begins to move upon my heart. And I've got to share this with you tonight. Please, I encourage you. This is not for popularity. You guys already know how I am. This is to get the message out. You know, even on our Facebook page, we have got friends that are on national television, very well known, that have sent me friend requests over the years. I, I will share it with each one of you privately, and I'm going to ask you, please share this as much as you possibly can. I feel it's that important of a message. This will air on Israeli News Live as well, because I feel like it is something my Jewish brothers and sisters must know. Let's get into it right now. Let's go over to Amos chapter 6, beginning with verse 3 here. We are using the Mamre, uh, Mechon, uh, Mamre.org website here for the Hebrew translation right here. Uh, if you have a King James Bible, you can follow along as well. Sometimes the verses are a little bit off in the KJV uh, or any equivalent thereof, but let's get right into it. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that thrum on the psaltery, that devise themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the cheap ointments, but they are not grieved for the hurt of Joseph or the affliction of Joseph." Therefore now shall they go captive at the head of them that go captive, and the revelry of them that stretch themselves shall pass away. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces, and I will deliver up the city with all that is therein. My Jewish brother, sister, when you listen to this message tonight, look at the similitudes that is laying in there. When we look at verse 6 there, but they are not grieved for the hurt or the affliction there, that is, of Joseph. But the thing is, is Amos the prophet, he's not talking about what happened to Joseph. He's not talking about what his brothers did to him, whether it be Simon, Judah, Levi, Issachar, uh, Naphtali, right on down, all of his brothers. He's not even talking about that time there. 
Although at the time it is clear and evident the prophet is referring back to that time because they did what? They moved themselves away. They did not want to hear his cries and his weeping as he was thrown into the bottom of the pit. No, they didn't want to hear that. Very sad, isn't it? We can read in the, in the, uh, in the canon that we have here, but I want to share with you from the book of Jasher. And I realize some might say, well, that book is not anointed. It is quoted from our own canon, the book of Jasher, but it is true. Yasher is actually how we should say the name of the book. Uh, we don't have a perfect uh, authenticity to know if it's one of the purest versions. By no means, I realize that. But it does help fill in the gaps in certain places. And tonight, that's the reason I want to use it, because the story of Joseph, it clearly fills in some very important gaps for us. And on this case here, the way they treated Joseph and how they responded to him, I think is very important. So let's look at this. Uh, this is from chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 42 in the book of Jasher. And Joseph called, un, uh, called out from the pit to his brethren and said unto them, What have I done to you? And what have I sinned? Why do you not fear the Lord concerning me? Am I not of your bones and flesh? Is not Jacob your father, my father? Why do you do this thing unto me this day? And how will you be able to look up to our father Jacob? And he continued to cry out and call unto his brethren from the pit. And he said, O Judah, Simeon, Levi, my brethren, lift me up from this place of darkness in which you have placed me and come this day to have compassion on me. You children of the Lord and sons of Jacob, my father. And if I have sinned unto you, are you not the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? If they saw an orphan, they had compassion over him. Or one that was hungry, they gave bread to eat. And one that was thirsty, they gave water to drink. Or one that was naked, they covered him with garments. Boy, that's a new thought on that passage there. I mean, we've seen this. Yeshua quoted this so many times, it's not even funny. And he even tells them, you've left off the greater things. Yeshua says this to the Jews when he was there. Remember that famous parable? About where he says, you clothed me and I was naked. When he gives the parable about, you know, Lord, when did we ever do this to you? He said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. You don't think that Yeshua for a moment maybe was trying to reach Israel at that time to get them to recognize that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had done these things? Do you not think it was a sign unto Israel? I wish I had that one already up here. I, I, I just caught that as I'm telling you now. And how then will you withhold your pity from your brother? For I am your, of your flesh and bones. And, I have, and if I have sinned unto you, surely you will do this on the account of my father. And Joseph spoke these words from the pit. Right? And his brethren could not listen to him. No, they couldn't listen. Oops, sorry. Lost a spot there. Okay. They could not listen, nor incline their ears to the words of Joseph. And Joseph was crying and weeping in the pit. And Joseph said, Oh, that my father knew this day, the act which my brothers have done unto me, the words which they have uh, this day spoken unto me. And all his brethren heard his cries and weeping in the pit, and his brethren went and removed themselves from the pit so that they might not hear the cries of Joseph and his weeping in the pit. Story sounds familiar, doesn't it? 2,000 years ago, once again, Yeshua HaMashiach, and maybe we'll say for the sake of argument for my Jewish friends that may be listening, instead of saying Messiah or Mashiach, let me just say Yeshua. Habin Yisrael, a son of Israel. He too was one of our own. But we didn't take the time to hear his cries. We didn't take the time to rescue him when he was being handed over by the authorities. Now we're not talking about the Roman authorities either. We're talking about the very rabbinical Authorities that handed him over. A priesthood that really had no business in the priesthood. 
the house Menean dynasty, the Maccabees had usurped not only the kingship, but also the priest. Now, the, the argument is that they were Le Levites as well, but they were not in the order of Zadok. And they took bribes. And of course, their sons and, as well clearly prophesied, even in the assumption of Moses, that this would happen. And Moses said that they were of a slave class. They would rise up. Also, it says that it would come the time when our temple would be destroyed by that of a king that would come up from the west. Clearly, the Roman king or prince, as Daniel calls him, a prince that shall come, that would be of the people and uh, that would destroy the sanctuary, the, 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 the people that would destroy the temple, uh, he would be of the people that would destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Speaking of a future prince coming, an antichrist, so to speak, is what Daniel was referring to, but the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary clearly was the Romans under Titus's command. The Arch of Titus clearly bearing record to this as well. All right, now let's move on though for the sake of time because I know it's going to take a lot of time to go through all of this here. I want to share this with you here, Genesis here, and we are dealing with, uh, oh goodness, I... I want to say we're in chapter 39. Let me just double chapter 37. I apologize. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. So we're backing up a little bit to set the stage. And he made him a coat of many colors. Now literally in Hebrew, it is a coat of long sleeves. That is one thing that is a little bit off here uh, in the translation. It is. It, there is some argument among scholars that it can be derived and be used as a word for multiple colors, uh, but it literally is, translates out to be a coat of long sleeves, and, and many uh, rabbinical uh, scholars will try to debate that with Christians. All right, so yes, I do know that it is a coat of long sleeves, but there is some argument that would hold uh, for that, and that's the word pasim uh, that you see on your screen right here. Uh, it's Katanot, uh, katanot pasim, a coat of long sleeves is what that is. And that can also be to the, to the feet as well. So it could have been to his wrist as well as to his feet there. But I think it's interesting and beautiful because my wife, when we look at it in the, in the English translation, if we take it as a coat of many colors, she had a remarkable revelation on this one day saying that it represented truly the children of Israel who are a a multiracial people throughout the world. And this is obvious because we, uh, the, the children of Israel, even all the way back to the time of our fathers, have married in among the different peoples. We have uh, Ruth, who is a Mobanite. We have uh, Moses marries uh, an Ethiopian, according to uh, scriptures there, when he marries uh, his wife Zipporah. We have many instances here where there is intermarriage in there. And not to mention, as the Jewish people have been dispersed to all the worlds there, we have intermarried in amongst the people in the populations that we live. To this day, there are Jews that are from every part of the planet. So there's no one color greater than the other that, that would be Israel. Israel is a coat of many colors. And of course, that coat represents your skin. And I thought it was a marvelous revelation that God had given my wife originally. But anyways, we go on here. Uh, and when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves uh, came round and about and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed yet a dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and to, and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast that has dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father kept the saying in mind. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock at Shechem. 
All right, and we're going to kind of hold it right there for just a moment. I want to share something with you here. I think this is very interesting about that particular prophecy. Do you realize, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I want to really speak to you about this. Do you realize that that was never fulfilled in Joseph's own life? This is one reason why we know the story of Joseph is a parallel to the life of Yeshua. One of the many signs that we know is laying right there. Because yes, his brothers do come down. They do bow before him when later he becomes the, the prince of Egypt, so to speak. And his father comes. But you know, his mother dies. So she never comes down. But in Christ, this is fulfilled. He is the only one that can fulfill it where both Brothers and mother will bow before him. Because why? The scripture says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he, Yeshua HaMashiach, he is Lord. That's where it will be fulfilled. Otherwise, Joseph's prophecy would be false. But because his life is a type of Yeshua, God knew it would be fulfilled in Yeshua his son, his son down through the generations, so to speak, as part of the children of Israel. All right, now, or you could say his brother if you wanted to go that route there. Uh, as we go on, though, this is where it gets really interesting, though, and this is what I got to share with you. As we look at the story here, and we, we go down, and we see that his brethren, um, you know, his father sends him down, uh, to go and find his brothers there. They're going down, they're, they're going to feed the flock there, and Jacob wanted to know what was going on with him. So he sends Joseph to go check on him. And of course, Joseph was always known to bring back an evil report. That's another thing I find interesting. It's not so much that I think that Joseph was a, a bad guy just trying to always say bad things about his brethren, but he, what does he do? He answers to his father. And Yeshua was the same way. Yeshua came down here, as the Bible says, making, making, oh gosh, that's another one. And I totally forgot about that as well. You know, God making, making known to himself, and I can't think of the scripture where that is out, but he makes the, in other words, he came in a body of flesh to make known to himself what was going on here. And what does Yeshua do? He reports back to the Father. And when he was among his brethren, what was he doing? Everything he sees that they're doing is bad. So he has to stand before the Father and give account for what Israel is doing and the evil and the wickedness. No wonder why when he was there and he says when he's on the cross, he said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Just like Joseph. Now, Joseph didn't know because Joseph being carnal and in the flesh, he didn't realize it until after the effect. So when his brethren do come down, he says, don't be angry with yourself. God did this to save life. Yeshua, though, on the other hand, he knew that they had to sacrifice him. Why? Because they were, you know, Israel was the priest of God. The Levites were the priests. They had to offer the sacrifices for sin. And unless they offered up Yeshua as a sacrifice, there would be no redemption for no one. You understand? So anyway, we get down here to verse, say verse 20. We start here. Now come now therefore and let us slay him. This is all right. They, they've come down. They see Joseph coming. Let me back up just a little bit here. All right, and Joseph said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they are, they are feeding the flock. Now, what's interesting, according to the book of Jesha, it was the angel of the Lord that had actually met him. Joseph didn't know it was the angel of the Lord, but it was the angel that met him. And he told him where they were. And the man said, they are departed hence. And I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And they saw afar off, him afar off, and before he came near unto them. They conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast, uh, cast him into one of the pits and we will say, An evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. Remember that? Remember when Yeshua was on the cross? They said, you know, when he began to speak in the unknown tongue, they said, let him alone. Let's see whether or not Elijah will come and save him. Doubters. See? They also said, he saved others, but he himself, he cannot save. 
Things like that, right? And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hand and said, let us not take his life. Reuben was an honorable man. He didn't want the evil to happen to his brother Joseph. But here's what's fascinating to me. His very name, the very names of the children of Israel and the parts that they play have so much to do with the events that surround Joseph's life as well. Reuben, for example, Reuben right here, and we have it right here, Reuben, literally, this is Roe, seeing us, son. So, in other words, the way you would translate Reuben's name would be, see our son, or behold a son, because Roe would be like, for behold, you can, you know, you can say behold, or you would say, see our son or see your son, whichever way you would want to translate that. But when they, in other words, when they would say Reuben's name, every time they're dealing with Joseph, because you have to understand, in Hebrew, this literally is a meaning right here. This means something to us in Hebrew. As a Jewish person, if you speak Hebrew, if you understand Hebrew, if you say Reuben, because we speak, you know, the, the Hebrew language is used all the time, and it's compound words that we use often. It's very common to use a compound word. Okay? Like, like for if you say, Shlomech, you know, uh, Ma Shlomech, how are you? The Shlomech is one word, but it's a compound word being, how, you know, uh, asking what is your piece is literally what it is, but it's two words put together. Ruben is the same thing. Behold your son. Behold our son. However you want to translate that there, but the point is, it's behold a son. The thing, though, that is so fascinating to me, though, not only were they saying, behold, a son, but it was prophecy about Joseph, but not just Joseph, but prophecy of the coming Mashiach, it would also come. And here's what's beautiful. Watch what happens here. If you turn over to John, uh, John chapter 15, I believe it is, no, chapter 19, verse 26, what does Jesus do? He gives another sign to the Jewish people that are there 2,000 years ago to recognize who he is. Now, I realize he's speaking to, to, uh, to John but, and, and to, or to his mother here. He says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, the disciples, excuse me, not plural, the disciples standing by whom he loved, which was John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. In Hebrew, he says to her, Isha Rubain. Behold your son. Little signs everywhere. Everything that Yeshua did when he was here was a sign to give you to understand that your Mashiach was right before your eyes. How did we miss and we rewrite when we move on down, of course, you know, after they've already, you know, they, they, they've sold him out. And then they take Joseph's coat, they kill a he goat, and they dip it in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it's your son's coat or not. And of course, Jacob goes into mourning like no other time in all the history. But you know what's really interesting to me? They trying to cover their sins killed this lamb, an innocent lamb, and they poured that blood upon that coat. And though they meant it to cover and try to hide their sins, do, that lamb became, as we see in the story of Yom Kippur, you offer the, the one lamb where you confess the sins of the children of Israel and he's taken out into the wilderness and let go to bear the sins of Israel far away, that was Joseph. He bore in his body the sins of his own brethren very far away. But a little lamb comes and dies as a temporal, notice so, it is a temporal sacrifice for their sins. It doesn't wash their sins away. Remember how the Bible says there is a remembrance of sin? It, the, the sacrifices of the, of the bulls and goats and stuff never could abolish sin because there was always a remembrance of sin. Do you realize that that scripture is speaking about the story of Joseph? Because even though they killed this lamb, they were trying to cover up their sins for what they did to their brother Joseph. 
But as a temporal sacrifice, God accepted that lamb that would only hide their sin until they can confess to make it right, until the scapegoat could be met face to face. I believe that this is where we get this part of the law of Moses of Yom Kippur and the offering of the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat that is to be done each year. Because that little lamb, that innocent lamb was offered up, not as really as a sacrifice, but to try to hide the sins of their brothers. And yes, it is presented to their father. And Joseph, he carried the true sin within him. They gave the lie. How did we miss him? Well, you'll know why in a minute. You'll know how we missed him in just a moment here. All right, now let's move on. Let's go now to Genesis, and we are now in chapter 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. As we know, his brothers sell him out. Now, you, it's good to have the book of Jasher to look at the way this story goes because we kind of, when we look at the way he is sold out, it looks like that uh, he's sold, uh, that, that, that the Midianites come and the Midianites themselves sell him out to the Ishmaelites. In the book of Jasher, it kind of clarifies that and clears that up, it actually shows us in the book of Jasher that the Midianites try to come and take him without paying for him or anything, uh, and they're going to go sell him as a slave. And his brothers intercede, they stop him, they sell him, the Midianites end up paying the brothers for him for 20 pieces of silver. So technically, they did buy, they did sell him to the Midianites. And the Midianites, then they begin to want to repent for what they were doing because they said he's a goodly boy. He can't be, he can't be a slave. So they got scared and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. And of course, the Ishmaelites sell him later to uh, Pontifer, who is what? A captain of the guard. Keep that in mind. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Pontifer, an officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hand of the Ishmaelites that had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. All right, so we know the story. We know how this happens. But then what happens? A bad thing begins to take place. Pontifer's wife ends up getting an eye for Joseph. There's a lot of things. I've been praying about this. Who does she actually represent in this case here? Obviously, we know that uh, Pontifer himself clearly represents the Roman uh, hierarchy in Israel's day when they come along that is obvious that that's who they represent there. They do represent uh, the, the Roman hierarchy there uh, because he was a captain of the guard. And he's an Egyptian, mind you. But watch what happens. This is another beautiful shadow here that was clearly laying in the story of Joseph. We go to verse 11. And it came to pass on a certain day when he went into the house to do his work, there was none of the men of the house there with, within. Now this is, Joseph is now dealing with this uh, Pontifer's wife who is in love with him, she's trying to entice him day after day to get him to sleep with her, but he is true to the God of Israel. I mean, this is a, this is a man that is what every man should be. True, if you're not married, stay true to God. Do not put your eyes on another man's wife, anything like that. Keep your soul pure. I'm going to do a message on this one day for men that are struggling with these things. Married men, no doubt. Bad enough, single men, but married men as well. I do want to do a message on that. But anyway, so, so anyway, it says that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled, fled forth, um, that she called, she called unto the men of her house and spoke unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto, uh, uh, unto us to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me and cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment by me and fled out and got him out. Uh, got him out. Now, I could not help but think of the similitude to the story of when Yeshua. Uh, of course, is being falsely accused already uh, by the mere fact that the 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 the, um, the high priest and all the other priests, the scribes, were all falsely accusing him continually. Uh, and then we have this famous scripture right here, over also in the book of John as well, 
uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 24, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, speaking about Yeshua's garment, but cast lots for us, whose it shall be, but uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. So, again, Pontifer being the captain of the guard, uh, but in this case, Joseph's garment is rent. Now, they cast lots for his vesture, so that would not be torn, but his other garments they actually divided among him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they tore them, but uh, it could be that one got a shirt, one got the shoes or something of that nature there. But then again, they may have actually torn his garments. I just think it's a very interesting little uh, sight, uh, tidbit there that we should not pass by. And, and very interesting indeed. Uh, then we move on into the story here. And at this point here, we're going to, to verse 9 here. We're dealing with chapter, uh, I believe we're in chapter 40. Yeah, starting here at verse 9 here. So we find though that the the butler, when we scroll down in the chapter here, again, the baker is taken out and hung after he interprets his dream. Exactly the three days, the three baskets on his head, the birds that pluck his flesh off of his body there. And then the butler, though, he is restored to his stewardship. But as it says in verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but he forgot him. And the sad thing then we move into Genesis chapter 41, and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, well-favored, and fat-fleshed, and they fed in the, in, in, in the reed grass. Now, I find this fascinating in itself here because there's a lot that can be said, and I'll save another message for going in and breaking down some of these other thoughts here about where they feed at, etc. But the two years that pass... The two years is another type. It's been 2,000 years since Yeshua as a type of Joseph came on the scene. In 2,000 years, the church itself has been bearing the cup as the cupbearer of the king. Who? The king of kings. We have carried on the communion service that Yeshua entrusted within us, but we have forgotten Joseph. We have forgotten the miracles that he did. We forgot that he was the one that prophesied that we would be restored. And we left him. We left him in prison. And the people have no idea. Israel has no idea the incredible, incredible miracles that Yeshua is able to perform. Not as a magician, but mind you, but in other words, that he was so great because we forgot. Very sad indeed there. But anyway, moving on there, going past that there, let's, let's go on. As we know the story, Pharaoh dreams of dreams and he sees the well-favored kind and we see that he, you know, the, the, the seven ill favor, they rise up, they eat the, the well-favored ones there and we see this as we move along there. And what's interesting, though, when you, when you go down to verse 9, uh, this is where we find out, not only did we know that the butler had forgotten, but as he's attending Pharaoh, Pharaoh is a type of this case here of the Father in heaven, only as a type, and I don't like really to use a Pharaoh as a type here, but in the respect that Pharaoh is a cupbearer and the church is the one that is supposed to be carrying out the, the command of Yeshua that said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And that wasn't just communion. That was also washing of the feet of the, of the, of the, the apostles. That was also the breaking of the bread, right? Well, he carried out that part faithfully, but forgot Yeshua, forgot Joseph that was in the prison. But then he does repent. Thank God the church is able to repent. Then spoke the chief butler unto the Pharaoh, saying, I make mention of my faults this day. We need a day of repentance for forgetting Joseph. We need a day for, 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 for repenting because why? The church itself is truly many of the members of the church today is the parts and the remnants of the house of Israel that God calls Ephraim. And when God says that he was ready to save Judah, the house of Judah, but idolatry was found in Ephraim. 
Maybe that's not just the statues that we've been placing up all over the place and worshiping instead of God, but it could also be the idleness of our worship. So there's definitely some repentance that needs to be going on without a doubt. So Pharaoh was with Ross with his servants and he, and he put me in the inward of the house, the captain of the guard, me and, and the chief baker, he says here. And we dreamed dreams in, in, in one night and I and, 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 and we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. So Joseph is brought out of the prison. And of course, as I said, the two days representing 2,000 years. I have to keep up with my notes here, friend. There's so many things that God has shown to me there. Now, while Joseph is, when he is brought out, he interprets the Pharaoh's dreams. The Pharaoh realizes now, is there a man, any man like this man? Remember what God says about Yeshua when, 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 when he, after he comes up out of the water after being baptized? See? I am, this is my son in whom I am uh, well pleased. When, when he stands there on Mount Transfiguration there and Moses and Elijah come up and they want to build tabernacles, one for Yeshua, one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And then, you know, they were all excited about it. And then suddenly a voice speaks out, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. There's your types. There's your shadows laying right in there. Okay. Hear ye him. So Joseph goes on. He gets that favor. He has the wisdom. Pharaoh puts him as second in command, just like Yeshua sits at the right hand of the Father on high. Right? But what else happens? Amazing. He marries Asenath. And by the way, in the Syriac Gospel, in their their version of the New Testament, which is the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church, they have a book called Asenath. You ought to read it. It's a beautiful book that tells the story about Joseph and Asenath and how they met. Incredible. But they get married. And of course, she is considered to be an Egyptian. A type of Yeshua taking a Gentile bride. And not only that, but you remember the prophecy given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Your seed shall be like the sand of the sea. Do you not realize, and like the stars of heaven, that the Bible says that when Joseph was gathering in the grain, it was as if it was the sand of the sea. And Joseph, as a type of Yeshua that takes on a Gentile bride, the believers in Yeshua become like the sand of the sea. Joseph gathers in the grain and it's typed out that it was as if it was the sand of the sea. So many you couldn't number it. There's type after type after type after type. All right, now let's move on to chapter 42. We have to skip a lot of the story for the sake of time here. We're going to begin here in verse 6 here. And this is when Joseph is going to accuse his brothers, right? The famine is set in. The seven good years he gathered in all the grain. Then the seven years of famine sets in. And as those seven years of famine set in, trouble sets in. And it's trouble, not just in Egypt, but over the entire region of this world. And everyone has to come to buy of Joseph. And sure enough, his own brethren come. And this is where we pick up. And Joseph was the governor over the land. Chapter 42, Genesis, verse 6. And he, he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came down, uh, excuse me, came and bowed down to him with their faces to the earth. Remember the vision Joseph has about the sheaves, the wheat, the bundles of the sheaves. And he says, your sheaves came and bowed before mine. Now, by the way, there was 11. Now, it doesn't happen here. It happens when Benjamin comes. But it's fulfilled when Benjamin comes because then the 11 sheaves bow. But his mother and father has never fulfilled fully until Yeshua come on the scene and literally will not be fulfilled until the resurrection when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess then. All right, And Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them. He made himself strange unto them and spoke roughly with them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? 
And they said from the land of Canaan to buy food. All right. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, You are spies to see the nakedness of the land you are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are upright men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but you come to seek the nakedness of the land. You are come. You see, this is why Israel is facing so much dilemmas. Even though they're in the quote-unquote homeland today, they're going through the dilemmas. Why? Because they have rejected Yeshua. They rejected their brother. And what did we read over there in Amos when we first started off? Remember that? Amos 6? 6.3? 6, Let me just jump back real quick. See? What did he say? That drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the cheap ointments, but they are not grieved for the hurt of Joseph. You forgot him. And this isn't speaking about Joseph, your brother, back in the times when Joseph was down in Egypt either. He is speaking about the very time when Yeshua come. Why do you say the thing it says? They drink wine in bowls. Because at the communion table, Judas Iscariot betrayed Yeshua, was drinking wine in the bowl or in the cup, so to speak, with them. And he did not care. He did not grieve for the hurt of Joseph. Or Yeshua and neither did Israel neither did his brethren okay so let's jump back over where we were here now so as we move on we see this we see what they were doing there right now here we go I have to pick up where I'm at to make sure I'm in the right place here so anyway we go down to verse 21 I want to jump down. We, we stop here, verse 10 or 11 there. Let's drop, drop all the way down to verse 21 and we pick up again here. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Again, Amos chapter 6. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spoke I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore also, behold, his blood is required. And sure his blood would be required. It'll be required 2,000 years, or not in this case, not 2,000 years later, but when Yeshua would come, it would be required. And in fact, had he not, had Israel not offered Yeshua up as a sacrifice, then there would be no redemption for us either. Because why? His not only did his blood have to atone for us, but the life that was in Christ had to come back upon us in order to unite us with our, our, our Mashiach, our Messiah, our mate. It is a, he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And there must come a uniting. And it takes the Spirit of God. He, in Him, He poured out the Spirit the life itself, so that the Holy Spirit could come upon you to unite you with your, with your mate, with your Messiah. Okay? Now, as we move on there, we find out though, as Reuben says, let's go on down to, all the way down to verse 24 as we're reading this here. All right? We know what Reuben said. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for, he, for the interpreter was between them. And he turned himself about from them and wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them and took Simeon from among them and bound him before their eyes. Do you not realize Simeon right here, et Simeon is a sign to Israel. It was a sign and no one seemed to recognize that sign. Simeon means hearing. One that hears. Right? Do you remember what Yeshua says over in the book of Mark? Chapter 8, let's start with verse 17. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand. Have you, ye your heart yet, yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear you not. Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves among five thousand? How many baskets full of fragments took you up? They say unto him, Twelve. When the seven among four, four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? They said, Seven. 
And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? All right? Do you not realize that that's exactly... When Simon's hands were bound, it was showing that at that time, God bind the hearing of Israel. They, could not, they had ears, but they cannot hear. They do not have the spiritual insight to recognize the coming of the Mashiach. And even when Yeshua says, you forgot about the five loaves that fed 5,000? Did you forget that when Joseph, 35 or 4,000 years ago, took the handful of grain, planted it into the ground, and it came forth in bountifuls? Do you think that when Yeshua was on the earth and he was multiplying the bread, he was showing that he was the Joseph that was there to them in Egypt, that it was, he was a type of that Joseph there that could multiply that handful of grain and fill entire silos, so much bread till he could feed them for the next, what, seven years. What do you got? Seven baskets. And why the 12 baskets? For the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph fed the 12 tribes of Israel for seven years. And here Yeshua said, how many baskets you take up? 12 and one. And how many was it on the other one there? Seven. And when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? Seven. There it is. Representing what? The seven years of famine. In other words, during that seven years of famine, you were still eating. All 12 tribes. Well, you might say, well, see, it was only 11 come. Don't forget, Joseph is one of those tribes as well. And he was, he was already there in Egypt. My gosh, what an amazing, amazing, God is so wonderful to make these things known to us. I just love him for it. Now, let's move on down here. I got another one for you as well. <laughs> Talk about being, not being able to hear. Where does that come from? Do you know it comes from Zechariah's prophecy? Zechariah chapter 7, verse uh, 10 and 11 here. And, uh, oh gosh, here it is again. Thus hath the Lord of hosts spoken, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you desire evil against his brother in your heart. Jeez. Remember what Joseph said in, in the book of Jasher? He said, remember our fathers Abraham and Isaac when they were hungry, they fed them. When they were thirsty, they give them drink. When they were naked, they give them clothes. He was reminding them how they were, and yet they were failing to do it. Mm. Verse 11, But they refused to attend, and turned a stubborn shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they might not hear. That's what happened. That goes all the way back to Joseph's brothers when they put him in the pit. And Zechariah is now remembering it. Yea, they made their hearts as an, as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his, his spirit by the hand of the former prophets. Therefore came their great wrath from the Lord of hosts. You have eyes to eat, see and ears to hear, but yet you don't see nor hear. So we move on down here to Genesis 42, verse 35. And as we're seeing the stories, we're coming to the conclusion here. They go back and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks, they behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they, when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob's father said unto them, Me, have you bereaved of my children? Joseph is not. Simeon now is not. And you will take Benjamin away upon me. All these things have come. And Reuben spoke unto his father, saying, Thou shalt slay my two sons if I bring not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him back to thee. Now, Jacob does not consent at this time here. It's not going to be until uh, later that he actually consents to him to go because the famine is so grievous in the land. And they do return. They do return. They go back. And this is where we pick up the story here. All right, so we go on over to Genesis chapter 43, verse 20 there. And I want to pick up verse 20 here and said, Oh, my Lord, we came indeed down the first time to buy food. Now that his brethren have returned. And as they return, coming back down to Egypt the second time, tribulation has been on for a while, right? They're coming down. And I kind of think that we, when we look at tribulation here, we might be looking at the tribulation of 2,000 years ago. 
when Yeshua was here, and even today. Tribulation coming on the scene. Two witnesses are about to rise up on the scene, right? But nonetheless, there's a seven-year tribulation according to the time of Joseph. So anyway, it says, it says here, they're coming down the second time. Joseph's wanting to have dinner with them. Very interesting. Now watch the type of dinner they have. And then you'll see the final sign a sign to the Jewish people, a sign to Israel today, to recognize who your Mashiach was. And he said, Oh my Lord, we came indeed down the first time to buy food. The brethren are going to try to repent, not for what they did to Joseph, mind you, at this point, but for the evils that is going on now, but it's really not their fault. And it came to pass when we came into the lodging place that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we have brought it back in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hand to buy food. We know not how, who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house, gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender. And they made ready the present against Joseph coming at noon, for they had heard that they should do what? Eat bread there. Sounds like a communion table to me, doesn't it to you? Didn't Yeshua say, you do not know what I do to you? He said, if you don't, why? If I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. It's laying right here in the story of Joseph the whole time. The whole time. The communion was laying right here in the story of Joseph. And isn't it interesting? Not only did, did, is there, there a foot washing, there's the breaking of the bread. Not only is there the breaking of the bread, but undoubtedly there's also a glass of wine there because we find out and when Joseph came home and brought him, him the present which was in their hand in the house and bowed down to him to the earth and he asked them of their welfare now all eleven have bowed Benjamin's there as well is your father well the old man of whom you spoke is he yet alive and they said thy servant our father is well he is yet alive and they bowed the head and made obeisance and he lifted up his eyes and saw Benjamin his brother his mother's son and said is this your youngest brother whom you spoke unto me. And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. He was never guilty, never a part of what happened to Joseph. Neither my Jewish brother today, you and my Jewish sisters, you were never there. I realize that. You're innocent. But watch what happens to Benjamin. And Joseph made haste, for his heart yearned toward his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face, came out, and he refrained himself, and said, Set on bread. And they set, in, set on for him by himself, and for them by themselves. And for, for the Egyptians they did eat with him by themselves, because Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for it is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now, to make a long story short, what happens? Joseph he dines them. They have the communion. The next morning, as the sun rises, he tells them to leave. He orders that his cup be put in Benjamin's bag. Why? He is the innocent one. But it is a sign to Israel. Not to a sign to Israel back then. It's a sign to Israel today. That though you may claim you were not there 2,000 years ago, yet the cup is in your bag. The innocent brother who was not guilty of the blood of Yeshua, but yet who was it? It was the Benjamites, his children, that would cry out for the blood of Yeshua later, saying, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And had his blood not been poured out as an atonement, let me tell you something, friend, there would be no remission of your sin. There would be no atonement, but it wasn't so much as the blood as it was his life that come out of him that comes back upon you. And if you as a Jewish man or a woman accept the saving grace of Yeshua HaMashiach, he will place his life in you. His blood will wash you clean and it will come off of your hands and it now will be in your heart. All you have to do is recognize you're holding the cup in your hand. What will you do with it? Judas betrayed him. 
at the communion table. We have the opportunity to accept Him. That's what we have. As John says here, as it says here in John chapter 13, Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. That also, it wasn't just Judas. I spoke of our fathers down through the next 2,000 years that would not know. Why? Why would they not know? Because the butler failed to remember what Yeshua was doing or what Joseph was doing. And as a result, for 2,000 years, we have kept him in a prison instead of revealing to our brothers who Yeshua is. So as we move on in chapter 44, and he commanded the steward of his house, saying, fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry, put all their money back in the sack and put my cup in Benjamin's bag. But you know, the beautiful part of the story is when they all were so fearful, when they realized they, they were now willing to confess what they had done to their brother, then Joseph said, don't be angry with yourselves. I'm your brother Joseph. What you did was to save life. My Jewish brother, sister today, what our forefathers did 2,000 years ago was to save life. We had to do as it was at Moses when, remember, when he took, God commanded him to take the elders of Israel and go out and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. That rock was Christ. That was our Mashiach. And had we not smitten that rock, the water would have not came out of it. When Yeshua was smitten by the Roman soldier and his side forth came water and blood separated from his body, just like out of the temple when the water was used to wash the blood out of the side of the temple and go down into the Kidron Valley. Water and blood came out of the temple. Yeshua was the temple. He was the place where the Holy Spirit was dwelling. He had within his heart what did he have in his heart? It was the Shekinah glory. It was the spirit of Almighty God living in him. And when his side was pierced, it released that life from him. And of course, he had already died. But it, in type, as in a figure, he was opened up and the water and the blood came out showing that the rock had been smitten. It had been judged by the elders of Israel. And that life could come back upon us as believers now that accept him as our sacrifice for our sins we can have the atonement and have the remission of sins that we don't come back here every year. See, we keep having to come back as Jews. We keep having to offer the sacrifice over and over and year after year. Why? There was always a remembrance of sin. Why? Because we knew what we did to Joseph and it wouldn't leave our heart. And that's been happening for the last 2,000 years. We just need to recognize who he is. My brother, Jewish sister, friends, brother, sister, this is your day. This is your day. Recognize Him as your Savior. Recognize Him. He is your Joseph. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Bless you and shalom. Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. If this has been a blessing to you tonight, friends, listen to me. We can't do this without your help. We need your help, not just financially. We appreciate that too. If you want to give, we thank you for that. You go to IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can help contribute to this, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. We need your help to get this message out. Do everything you can, friends. Share it everywhere you can. Every Jewish friend that you have, share it with them. Email it to people. Post it in other places please let people know you know but if you're posting and it's on someone's site ask permission please just share with them that it's really important ask permission ask them if it's all right if they would post this on their on their page or wherever it may be let's get the message out israel needs to wake up the hour is fast approaching the coming of the mashiach we want to see so many accept him now before that tribulation time sets in. I'm Stephen Benoon. God bless you and thank you. And do, we thank you as well for those of you, your contributions to keep this ministry alive. Thank you for that as well. Good evening.